Well, thank you so much for uh, uh, doing for us, and we're really looking forward to um, you know um, uh, the words of wisdom you have to share uh, with us in this talk. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for the kind words and for the introduction, and welcome to everyone. I'm, I'm really grateful for the opportunity to to speak with you this morning, this evening, or or this afternoon, depending on on where you are. So as as has been mentioned, I'm going to talk about gigasample per second analog to digital converters in 16 nanometer or lower process technologies. Okay. So here's the outline of the presentation. I'm gonna start by identifying um, the need and, and challenges of gigasample per second ADCs and sub 16 nanometer process technologies using uh, digitally modulated radar as the driving application as an example application, um, followed by an assessment of where we are, and what we need to do, and I'll give some, show some example implementations, and um, then I'll make some conclusions and recommendations finally. Okay, digitally modulated radar. This particular example of Digitally modulated radar is actually phase modulated continuous wave. Um, and the, the reference that's shown at the bottom of, of the slide here is from researchers at IMEC in Belgium. It's a, it's a really good paper. They've done a bunch of really good work in this area, so I highly recommend it. Um, and a DMR based radar system, a digital pseudo random binary sequence as shown here on, on, in the figure to the right, it's used to modulate the phase of a typically 79 gigahertz continuous wave, sine wave, which is then transmitted as a range finding signal. Okay. The pseudo random binary sequence is designed to enable both unambiguous range, which is how long, longer is better, and range resolution, which is pulse width, which is the example sequence is shown on the right here. And <clears throat> that comes down to bandwidth and potentially provides excellent immunity interference. Um, the reflective signal is then received and processed, which means correlating and accumulating to determine the range and velocity of, of using an FFT of the target. Why is it good? The wave generation is relatively simple. You don't have to have fast selling, highly linear frequency synthesizers as is typically required in a frequency modulated continuous wave FMCW radar that's generating frequency chirps. This is much simpler. These codes that are used um, are carefully designed to be essentially random and to have really good, nearly perfect, in quotes, um, correlation properties, and they provide excellent range resolution and potential immunity to interference. Uh, MIMO techniques can be applied, beamforming can be applied to a DMR-based system to improve range and angular resolution. Uh, the receiver is predominantly digital, as shown here. I mean, there, there's going to be an LNA, of course, but you get to an ADC, and after that, there's correlating to start with, and then accumulating, and then FFTs and further processing happens afterwards. And the processing can provide, depending on how you set it up, you know, 70 dB or more processing gain, which is extremely helpful, obviously. And this is ideally implemented in a really fine geometry, FinFET type process technology. Uh, is there a catch? Yeah, there, there's always a catch. Since the achievable performance and accuracy of this system is directly proportional to the bandwidth, or more is better, of the range finding signals, the ADC that samples the received signal has to have a very wide bandwidth, two to five gigahertz, depending on how you set things up, compared to 10 or 20 megahertz for an FMCW-based system. So clearly this is significantly um, more difficult for the ADC. But as an ADC designer, that, that's why, why we're so interested in this. It's got some really good challenges to, to work on. Um, so a 10-bit, is what it turns out, you're gonna need at least 10 bits. Time interleaved architecture as shown on the right here. 
with the associated clock skew, jitter, all those kind of issues, low supply voltage. That's, what, that's what's going to be needed. Because the gigasample per second ADC output is correlated in real time with the right random sequence that was used to modulate the carrier phase, extremely high speed digital signal processing is also needed for the correlation that's going to happen. And today's uh, radar systems, the there's a transceiver um, SOC and a signal processing SOC that are separate. And then there's a question of do you um, partition the ADC onto the transceiver or onto the signal processing SOC? Um, and I, we, we've seen it both ways. The current trend is to put the ADC on the transceiver pretty much all the time now. So let's just think about this a minute and, and use an example of a, of a you know, fairly conservative um, transceiver that's got four transmit antennas and paths and four receive paths. So that's four ADCs with 10 bit wide, 10 gigasample per second data coming out that we need to get across to the other SOC that does the signal processing. So, you know, Four ADC to 10 BTs, that's 40 pins. That's that's never going to happen on a transceiver SOC. Um, so then the, the answer would be possibly to convert them to serial using serial, serial interface um, circuitry. That would save a bunch of pins, but then, you know, 10 gig sound per second, 10 bit wide data converted to serial um, is going to be incredibly high speed and probably prohibitively um, difficult. So the ideal situation then would be to put the transceiver and the ADCs and the signal processing all on the same die in a single chip so they don't have all these interface issues. Uh, I guess you could also put the ADC on the SOC and then, and then send the RF signal across. That's also extremely challenging. So again, the desired solution here is to put all this on the same SOC in 16 nanometer or lower. And so that's the big message from the bottom bullet point here. ADC and signal processing should both be implemented in the same sub-16 nanometer process technology. That's that's what we're trying to, to get to. There, there's um, clearly other examples of situations like this, like 5G telecommunications, uh, the coming 6G. They all need data converters. Um, in a, in a process technology like this with extensive signal processing. Okay, so this is, you know, this, this, this DMR is an example, but it's not the only one, certainly. So we definitely have a need for data converters in sub-16 or 16 nanometer or lower process technologies. Okay, so now I'm going to go through some status of where we are and, and talk a little bit about what might be needed. First, some background on benchmarking because we're going to compare uh, converters and where they're being done and what performance is being achieved. So analog to digital converters are almost exclusively compared these days based on figures of merit of one kind or another. For high speed, ADCs, the most commonly used figure of merit is the Walden. It's also known as EQ, and there's the equation here for it. It's power divided by two detected number of bits times two to the, the bandwidth. Detected number of bits here has to be measured, not, not simulated, but measured, so they would get a, a clear picture. So this is essentially a measure of energy per conversion step in picojoules or femtojoules. And this is a key point to remember, lower is better for this figure of merit. So I'm going to show some charge coming up here of EQ versus effective number of bits and EQ versus bandwidth for a number of university designed ADCs and some industrial designed ADCs, okay? First, a word or two about figure of merits for ADCs using automotive applications. The critical requirements in rank order, especially for automotive, First one is, does it actually work, <laughs> okay? Specifications like, um, hold on a second here. 
like interference-free diamond range, IFDR, offset error variation, OEV, analog delay variation, things like that obviously don't show up in the, in the figure of merits that are used. Error. But let me talk a minute about what, what this is about. We did a, an analog front end with eight ADCs um, that went on the same SOC as five microcontrollers, several million gates of custom DSP, uh, several megabytes of flash memory. And with all of this running at the same time in, in a radar system, the critical requirement is that interference at the input to the ADC or coming out of the ADC um, has to be down from full scale by more than 90 dB. That's an absolutely critical requirement. Um, offset error variation, OEV, that's talking about, you know, the, the offset can be tolerated, but it needs to be consistent. Can't be varying all over the place. And some of the ADCs our customers had used were doing that. And so that's why they came to us and why we work with them and use the architecture that we did to, to avoid that issue. And that also gets one of our ethanoids involved in there. And then, as I said, we had eight ADCs, and the latency through those ADCs needs to be consistent also. That's what analog delay variation, ADV, is, is getting at. And so clearly, those are not included in the figure of merit, but are absolutely essential in the application, okay? And so if, it's got a, if the ADC has a great figure of merit but can't do these other things, then it's not useful uh, for, for, for us in, in the industry. Um, next requirement is the ADC manufacturable and high volume production with automotive temperature ranges and reliability. Um, let me give an example of this. When I was an associate editor for the Journal of Solid State Circuits, I had a paper submitted that had outstanding figure of merit, outstanding performance for the ADC, and it, it looked like a shoe-in for, for being accepted for publication. But about three-fourths of the way through the paper in the section on measurements, there was a sentence stating that all the measurements were taken at four degrees C. Not not three, not five, but four, you know? And so that that's sure I, I'm probably useful for something, but for you know broad wide use like automotive applications, that's that's not useful at all. And then the last requirement here, essential requirement is is it a cost effective solution. If the ADC requires um, special components that take a bunch of extra masks in the process technology, or if the ADC is really efficient, but it takes uh, an input and buffer and a reference buffer that use a, a watt of power, that, that's not gonna work either. So it needs to be cost effective and including the whole system, not just the ADD by itself. Okay, so if those requirements are met, then we can start talking about figures of merit, okay? Um, ADC performance is widely and aggressively published. It's all based on figures of merit in IEEE literature. Um, so here's here's some charts. So this is the figure of merit EQ versus ENOB. The blue diamonds are industrial publications, and the green squares are university. These are from ISSCC and CICC for the last few years. And then there's these yellow triangles that are from IBM that I'll come back to later. But looking at this chart, clearly there's a distinct separation and grouping. And remembering that this figure of merit lower is better, you can see that the best figure of merit papers are being published by universities, clearly. Okay, here's the same data, but this time it's plotted with the figure of merit versus bandwidth. And once again, the, the grouping is very clear. The industrial papers are, through the blue diamonds, our figure of merits are higher, or in other words, worse than the university publications, okay? So here's a summary of the situation and some concerns. So clearly, looking at that data, universities are publishing or producing the overwhelming majority of the published gigasample per second ADCs with the best figure of merits. But only three of those ADCs have been implemented in 16 nanometer and none 
in sub 60 nanometer. There's a few in 28, but most of them are 40 nanometer or higher. And then universities focus primarily on figures of merit in order to get their research published. They have to. But at the same time, industry needs sub 16 nan sub 16 nanometer gigasample per second ADCs with specific application based requirements, high yield, um, FDR, those kind of things, and excellent figures of merit. Need both. But and this is a quote from Marcel Pelgrim that was in the IEEE Salsa Search and Magazine from fall of 2019. Industry contributions to ISSCC have dropped to 30%. And in absolute numbers, the 1974 level has been passed in the downward direction. Okay, why? And, and this is my own personal and, and humble opinion. It's because industrial companies working on their own are typically short-term financially driven. They're usually not willing or able to invest sufficiently in long-term internal research. Okay. And I'll come back to, the, to that after these examples. So next, I'm going to present some example implementations. Uh, the first one is time interleaved. The second one is time based. And the third is, is a hybrid of, of both. This is an excellent example. And it's an exceptional performance that was achieved by, by authors primarily from IBM. These are the yellow triangles in those um, figure merit plots. This is one of them. This is a 72 gigasample per second, 8-bit ADC and 14 nanometer CMOS. So the authors are primarily from IBM, but they also have collaborators from ETH in Zurich and EPFL in Lausanne. But how, and then this is an example of how industry with some collaboration from excellent universities can produce really outstanding results. As you can see here, there's um, 64 interleaved asynchronous SAR ADCs, each with eight comparators. And then it's carefully designed clocking and interleaving circuitry that's shown in figure two on the right. And this, this is all put together to achieve the uh, following outstanding performance. So this top plot is with a Lower frequency, and by lower frequency, I mean 10 gigahertz input. This is sampling of 72 gigasamples per second. Um, as shown, the SNDR is 39.3 dB. Um, the power consumption at, with that input frequency is 97 milliwatts. And then this one is up close to Nyquist, you know, 36 gigahertz input. And the SNR or SNDR goes down to 30.5 dB, and the power consumption goes up to 235 milliwatts. But it's nonetheless really outstanding performance for 72 gig samples per second. Okay, next. This is a one giga sample per second, 2.3 milliwatt, 8 bit ADC, and 65 nanometer CMOS. This work was from a, a researcher from Kagoshima University in Japan. It's an excellent example of an ADC architecture that would be ideal for a sub-16 nanometer process technology. Um, it's comprised of, of coarse and fine voltage to time converters and then time to digital converters. The architectures for the um, time domain quantizer and, and comparators are shown on the right. And this is the performance they got. The plot on the left is showing um, a 10 megahertz input, while the sample rate is varied from uh, 500 megahertz to one giga sample per second. And as you can see, the SNDR is very constant at around um, 45 dB. And again, this is an 8-bit converter, so that's, that's quite good. And then on the right, the plot is with a gig sound per second varying the input frequency. And again, the SNDR and SFDR are fairly flat across there. So it's really good. Okay. This last one 
is another example of a possible uh, giga sample per second ADC architecture that was worked on at NXP in 16 nanometer. Um, in this technology, it looked to be possible to design a sample and hold that was capable of doing the sampling at, at the highest rate, eight gig samples per second, thereby avoiding all of the issues with time interleaf sampling. So um, it was a, a significant advantage taking best advantage of, of what the technology was capable of. Then the sampled voltage is converted to a current and then applied to a multiplying digital to analog converter as in a pipeline ADC. So, and then a residue current is generated based on where the input was. And then the current is applied to um, an array of interleaved VCO based or time based ADCs. So this kind of takes advantage of, of both um, time interleaving and time based architectures. You can see the reference to the patent there. Okay, conclusions and recommendations. So clearly progress is being made, but also clearly there's lots of work left to do. Industry needs to collaborate closely with university researchers through internal and external funding. And then industry needs to collaborate closely with university researchers to ensure that the developed ADCs meet all the requirements and not just figure a merit. And again, you know, an ADC that works at four degrees C is not useful for most applications. We need to work with the, with the researchers to make sure that's not what we get. Universities and IEEE conferences need to be willing to consider accepting an ADC with possibly a slightly worse figure of merit, but that actually works in, in real life. And then this last one, I'm, this, is a, this is a call to action. Industry and other funders, funding sources like government need to collaborate with the university researchers to provide regular and consistent access to sub-16 nanometer process technologies. And that's, that's um, I hope we can all come together and, and make this work. And that's the, that's the end. Thank you for your attention. I appreciate it very much. So please, I'm open for questions at this point. Thank you very much, Doug. That's a great talk. I saw a couple questions come in. Let me um, uh, just uh, go by the time they come in. So the first question is uh, from Ashwin Bart. The question is, we see a general trend in warden figure of merit being higher from industrial publications, but leveraging from certain tested architectures from universities could help build upon earlier designs thus making or hoping and further decrease in warden figure of merit? So the, the hope is that we can, the industry and universities collab, can collaborate more closely to ensure that we get good figures of merit, but more importantly, that the ADCs actually work and meet all of the requirements for a particular application. Because focusing exclusively on figures of merit can result in NADCs that work at four degrees C and nowhere else. And that's, again, not useful for, for a real world application. So what I'm proposing is that we all work together more closely to make sure that what we get actually works with, and, and still achieves a great figure of merit so they can get published. But I, I, as you can see, I, I don't agree with um, deciding whether something gets published or not exclusively on figures of merit. I think if it's, if it's truly innovative and has a lot of, of industrial and, and real world application, then I think it should get published, even though the figure merit might not be state of the art. That, that's my, my own opinion. Yeah. Uh, so Ashwin also made another comment. Uh, he said, that, for example, university publications don't focus on check and hold reliability when boosting gate voltages for better Linearity, yeah. yeah, which in industry might reduce lifetime, yeah. yeah that's, that's exactly the, the kind of thing that, that I'm, I mean, it's just an excellent question and an excellent point. 
And that's exactly what I'm talking about. You know, we need to work with the university researchers to make sure that things like the track and, track and hold that's using gay boosting um, is reliable enough to be actually used in, in applications. Yeah. Great, great question. So we have a question from Ali Reza. He said, uh, could you please explain where the spurs are originating from in the output spectrum plot of the Intel ADC? Thank you. Of the Intel ADC? Mm -hmm. There's not an Intel ADC there, right? I think he meant meant to IBM ADC, I guess. Yeah, the IBM. Yeah. So, um, so you can see they they've got a harmonic plot of there. Mm -hmm. um, I suspect that most of this is from clock skew. Those, those spurs look like they're um, based on on clock skew errors. It doesn't, especially at seventy two gigahertz. It doesn't take much clock skew to um, cause this kind of behavior. And and in interleave, you also get spurs from um, offset mismatch between the interleave channels. There's 64 of them here. And also gain mismatch for the ADCs. So I, I think those spurs are all from that. They're all from, those are interleaving artifacts, which is why this architecture that, and you know, this isn't gonna work at 72 gigahertz, obviously. Yeah. But if you can avoid the interleaf sampling, that that takes a bunch of, of issues out of the out of the mix. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Doug. So we have a, another question from Professor Sergio Bambi in Brazil. Uh, so he asked, on your call to action, uh, go to provide uh, academic researchers, PhD students, and the alike access to the uh, advanced sub sixteen nanometer process technologies. How can this be funded? Any suggestions? And by the way, south of the border, universities have no longer access through. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I have to admit that I don't have a, a perfect solution to this problem. Um, there are some examples like, like IBM enabled access to 14 nanometer. Intel is currently um, providing access to professors for their 22 FinFET technology. Mm -hmm. um, but companies like NXP or Qualcomm that um, don't do their own process technologies at 16 nanometer or lower, there needs to be collaboration between the foundries, the governments, um, industrial companies, and, and things like uh, funding mechanisms like the SRC and, and, and things like that, National Science Foundation, in the US and, and equivalent entities in other countries need to work together to figure this out. And again, I don't have a perfect solution. That, that's why I'm, I'm calling to action here that we can all figure out working together how to do this because it's needed as you can see from the presentation. Yeah. Uh, Jeff, yeah. Uh, Doug, if I may add, there's actually a very interesting uh, um, uh, webinar uh, to be held on April the 7th uh, morning U.S. time, uh, uh, hosted by Boris Merman, where um, the, the the nature of the the, uh, the topic of the talk is democratizing IC, IC design, and so basically uh, companies like Google is actually poning up, working with uh, um, uh, uh, companies like Skywater, I believe, uh, poning up uh, uh, free uh, shuttle uh, uh, oh. resources to uh, actually uh, uh, um, uh, uh, enable uh, uh, more university research. Now, whether it's advanced nodes or not, that, that, that remains to be seen. But I thought, you know, speaking of university collaboration uh, to get uh, more uh, um, silicon access, I thought I'd bring that up. It's on April 7th. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Great. Great. Anyways, I thought that might be an appropriate comment to add here. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, sorry. So I cut the Sergio's comment in half. I think he also mentioned uh, they don't have access to the um, through even uh, MOSES, uh, let alone 16 nanometer uh, thing that yeah. uh, CMOS. Yeah, so that's his comment. Yeah, so yeah. I, I appreciate the situation. And again, I, my recommendation, my, my call to action is that we all need to work together and figure this out somehow. I'm not sure what the answer is. Mm -hmm. uh, but you're working with the foundries at Samsung and TSMC and, and other places, global foundries. We need to figure something else so that University researchers can get access to these technologies. 
and so that you know universities and industry can um, get the work the research done that that needs to be done here and, and clearly there's a lot And also, Sergio was saying this uh, Skywater initiative is fine and great, but I doubt they will have access to 22 nanometer foundries. That's his comment. I, I think Sergio is probably right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and he will oh. also say, thank you, Doc. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 